It's day 275 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365, day two of the New Testament. I hope you guys are doing well today. I feel refreshed today. I'm ready to get into the Word. But before we get started, if you could please help us out by liking this video, making sure you're subscribed to the channel, hit that notification bell so that you know when the video drops because some people may not know that these videos come out at all different times. Last night it was very late just because I had a very hard time getting everything done amidst all the things I had to do over the weekend with my family. So I appreciate your grace and patience in waiting for that new video to come out yesterday. And also getting into our Facebook group helps out a lot because that's where you can ask questions, you can hold conversations, and see all of the latest things that are coming out of this Bible study. And if you are new here, welcome. We started at the beginning of 2023. We're gonna finish out strong at the end of this year finishing the Bible in its entirety, and then God doing new things in 2024. So I am excited about that. But let's go ahead and pray and get started. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You are a holy God. We just glorify you, magnify the name above every other name, Jesus. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for being our Savior, our Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you for the ability to be able to be in your presence, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us that access to the Father in heaven. I just ask now that you please open up our eyes, ears, and hearts to be able to hear your word, to receive it, to understand it. Pray for wisdom, Lord. Help us to grow in our knowledge. Help us also to forgive people, Lord, whether they have hurt us, because sometimes it is that unforgiveness or that bitterness that might hold us back from being able to access your word and to be able to do it with clarity. So I pray that you'll clear away the chaff right now. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Show us where we may have gone wrong. And I just pray that we will go and make it right. Give us everything we need today through this word, Lord. I pray that you will meet our needs and that most of all, God, we will be able to offer it back to you as a sacrifice, as we internalize it, as we meditate on it, and we will really start to understand our placement and who we are in you, and we'll become secure and confident and bold in that. In Jesus' name, amen. Starting a new gospel today in the book of Matthew, the author we assume is Matthew, and written somewhere between 50 and 70 AD. So he was on the scene with Jesus, one of his disciples, but he didn't write what happened until approximately 50 years later. And he emphasizes the fulfillment of the prophecies by Jesus. And this is one of the most quoted gospels of the New Testament. So this one is uh, has an emphasis on the kingdom of God. Matthew talks about it 33 times. It emphasizes God's righteousness and the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. So it kind of bridges the gap between the Old Testament promises and the New Testament fulfillment. The audience here is Jew, uh, the Jew, whereas Luke were the Greeks and John was kind of like an overall for everyone. So this one is geared toward the Jewish audience. So we start off here in chapter one, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So this is providing the genealogy. We have not seen this yet because Luke did not provide it whenever we read about it in chapter one. So Matthew is more focused on where Jesus is coming from. It's focusing on his lineage, whereas Luke kind of just focused on the birth of Jesus and the fact that he came forth. So he's focusing on the kingship here. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Notice that's a woman. Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nation, Nation the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, another woman, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, another woman, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. So the main things to point out here in this first part of the genealogy is that Jesus has the right to the throne, both by genealogy or race, as well as royalty. So he has it through Abraham being a son or a descendant of Abraham, and then also coming from David the king. So he has rights to the kingship through both of those avenues. And the whole purpose of a genealogy was for a person to be able to prove where they came from. And so in this case, it's proving that they are an Israelite, that Jesus came from Abraham. It also identified their tribe and qualified certain Jews for religious duties. And again, in this case, being that he came from David, he is qualified as both a Jew 
and to rule spiritually. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asaph, Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, Joram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. Now, why was I pointing out the fact that there were women stated in this genealogy? Because typically in this time, women were not recognized they were not treated well and especially where the gospel was rejected women are treated poorly it still happens this day to this day in nations where the gospel's rejected women pretty much treated poorly where the gospel has touched the nations where the gospel is alive and active women are treated a little bit better wherever jesus is he raises up women he brings them out from that place of oppression and so let's take a look at some of the women that are mentioned here in this genealogy we've got tamar who if you remember her she was the daughter-in-law of judah who after her husband died and none of the brothers would take her as wife to give her a child she went and disguised herself as a prostitute so that she could then sleep with her father-in-law and have a baby. Scandalous, right? Then we have Rahab, who was also a Canaanite harlot or prostitute of Jericho. But she's the one who covered the spies whenever Joshua was coming into Jericho, and therefore she was honored by God. And then there was Ruth, who was a Moabite, not even a Jew, not an Israelite, but she converted to the faith, and therefore she is going down as one of the greatest women in history. Then we have the wife of Uriah, who of course is Bathsheba, involved in sin with David of horrendous proportions. So some people might say, so what? Well, the what is, is that God will take the people who have the darkest of sins and he can still turn it around for good. He can still take the darkest life, the most evil walk, not saying that they had the most evil walk, but there was a lot of sin involved in their lives, and yet turns it around and he brings them to a place of honor. He can take the lowest of lows and place them into royalty. This is the lineage of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and these women are a part of that. That is the heart of God. He so delights in being able to rescue people, to be able to rebuild them and he wants to do that with our lives as well we are no different from the people that are listed in this genealogy we too are a part of the royal lineage being under the blood of Jesus Christ the fact that he puts that crown on our head we are a child of God whenever we come into the salvation and when that happens the beautiful thing is that he makes all things new he brings us into that new covenant he gives us a new name he gives us a new purpose in life he gives us a new beginning. So if you've been struggling a little bit in that condemnation, that is not of the Lord. That is of the enemy. The enemy will constantly try to condemn you and make you relive your failures over and over. You got to just tell him, shh, shh, shh. Because today I know is a new day. Today I'm going to rise up in my identity in Christ. I know that I'm a new creation. I know that he's got my back. I know that the cross completed the work and therefore I am going to live this day with a new perspective and rejoice in my salvation. Verse 12, and after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel the father of Abiah and Abiad the father of Eliakim, Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliad, Eliad the father of Eliezer, Eliezer the father of Mathen, Mathen the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So let's stop right here for a second because there's a whole lot to unpack. Jacob the father of Joseph. Don't get this confused with his actual son, Joseph. We're skipping generations quite a bit through here. So when we say Jacob, the father of Joseph, we're saying great, 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 great grand son, Joseph, this being the husband of Mary. Notice it never says the father of Jesus because Joseph is like the foster father of Jesus. He is the foster dad uh, because he's not the one who gave Mary the baby, even though he is betrothed to her. And then we see the different names of Jesus. Now, there are some people who 
will get really sensitive about this and say that we cannot call Jesus anything but by his Hebrew name, Yeshua. But we've got to remember that he was born into a culture that is Greek. Greek is the language that is being recorded here. And this is merely just a human name. Jesus was actually a very common name back in the day. And the Greek form of it is Christos, which means anointed. That is the character of Jesus. That is who he is. He is the anointed one. Christian means little Christ. So that's where we got the word. So meaning anointed one. We are also the little Christ who are anointed ones. Verse 17, so all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. So what's interesting here is that the Hebrew name of David is actually 14 in numerical value. So it's interesting to see how this all kind of comes together. And I know I had a post-it note around here. Here it is. So the three groups of the 14 generations, the first one in that first paragraph from Abraham to David, and this was connected to the Abrahamic covenant, and it established the Davidic throne. It established that the Messiah would come from the line of David. Then the second group here was from David to the deportation of the exiles to Babylon. This was with the Davidic covenant, and the throne during this time was actually cast down. And then we go from the deportation to now having Christ on the scene. And the throne is again confirmed through Jesus. So this is uh, connected to the new covenant. So lots of things happening. No one would have ever caught that. Thank God for scholars who have, you know, dug this stuff up and made the connections. And so that is how we see that now. The importance of the genealogy and what it meant. Verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, and remember that means that they are officially engaged to be married. For one year, they, are already, they have already taken the oath that they are going to be committed to each other lifelong. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit, which we already read about in Luke. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame. And I just love this about Joseph, the fact that he is a moral man, but he's also so merciful toward Mary that he would not publicly disgrace her. He could have, based on infidelity, he could have taken her out to the courts, you know, and had her probably stoned to death for adultery, but he didn't. He decided to, re he resolved to divorce her quietly, which means he would just take her before two witnesses and quietly send her on her way. So he was very logical, but also very mystical. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. So I'm sure he was scared because there is not only the public disgrace of the infidelity, but he now will also be ridiculed and mocked because of this situation. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So the angel is letting Joseph know, she did not cheat on you. <laughs> this has been immaculate conception. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So this is identifying Jesus to Joseph, his foster father, as the savior of the world. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Isaiah, of course, in chapter 7. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So this is the ultimate fulfillment of the prophecy by Isaiah. And remember, he was consoling King Ahaz at this time when he gave him this prophecy because all of the, the two other kings were plotting against him. And so that is when he received this prophecy. And so yet we see another name of Jesus. We had the, uh, the Christ, we had Jesus, and now we see Emmanuel, which is his descriptive name. And by the way, the word Emmanuel or the name Emmanuel, it's never one of the names that we call upon. No one ever prayed to the name Emmanuel uh, because it basically was a description of him and not necessarily a name that would actually uh, draw attention from him. So this name, God with us, describes him as the one who is God. 
that shows his deity. He is God. And it also displayed his nearness to man through the Holy Spirit, the fact that he is with us. And so the names that people would usually call him were either rabbi, teacher, master, maybe even Jesus, but never Emmanuel. But it's still one of his names. And that means God with us. And when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not. So he did not sleep with her until she had given birth to a son. So this shows that eventually they do consummate their marriage. They do sleep together. And so I know there is a teaching out there that says that Mary is perpetually a virgin, that she remained a virgin throughout her life, but she did not because this scripture right here says otherwise. So he had no hesitation. As soon as he got the word from that angel, he took his wife as the Lord commanded him and he did not fear, which is a beautiful thing. The fact that he is a moral man. And so when he heard from the Lord, he knew that that word was indeed from God. Now, going back to the names of Jesus, we also see another name for Jesus as his prophetic name as Jehovah Sidkenu. So, which means you are my righteousness. We saw that in Jeremiah chapter 33. So we will see his name pointed out as this later on in the millennial kingdom. Okay, going back to the book of Luke, we are now in chapter two. And looking upon the birth of Jesus, we saw the birth of John the Baptist yesterday, how he came forth to prepare the way, and now we see the birth of Jesus. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. So who is Caesar Augustus? Well, this is a title. So this was actually Gaius Octavius, and this was the Roman emperor, because remember, we've got Rome in power of the entire empire, so that's why he is the Roman emperor. And Caesar the Augustus one is who this is, and this is sort of like an elevated title. He served or ruled from 31 BC to AD 40, so he had quite a bit of a reign here. So in those days went out a decree that all the world should be registered. So there is a census that is going to be taken, but not for the sake of just registering names and genealogies and history. This was a census that was being sent out and decreed in order to tax the people. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. So he's the dude that is going out to collect all the money. This is actually fulfilling the prophecy in Micah chapter 5 verse 2 that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem because what's going to happen is now Mary and Joseph have to go back to their hometown in Bethlehem and that's how Jesus will be born there. Right now they're in Nazareth. This was the first registration when Quirinius, the governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. So this was about a three-day trip that he would have to take across 90 miles because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth and she gave birth to her firstborn son. So this, I, I asked the question, so does that mean she had other kids later on? Well, we know Jesus is her firstborn anyway, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. So this manger being the feeding trough, these trough, these swaddling cloths being strips of fabrics uh, that would keep his legs and his arms straight. So he's wrapped in that. But again, all of these details fulfilling the prophecy. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. So these are just regular old shepherds watching over the flock so that they don't get robbed. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone upon them. And they were filled with great fear, of course, because the angel was big, bad, and mighty, right? Not bad in a bad way, bad in a good way. So this is the glory of the Lord that they are seeing. This is the evidence of God's presence among them. It is the light in the midst of darkness that they are seeing here. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. So this gospel, this good news of the Savior of the world, the Messiah, is for everyone, for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, meaning Bethlehem, not Jerusalem, 
a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So a Savior, Jesus, who is the Messiah, the Anointed One. The thing I love the most about this section is that God sent the angel to tell outcasts the good news first. He didn't send them to the kings. He didn't send them to the dignitaries. He sends them to the shepherds who are on the outside of the field watching over the flock. I love that because that's us. We are the outsiders. We are the ones where the good news is proclaimed. We're the ones who probably don't feel worthy to even receive it, yet we do because that's the way of God. He loves the outsider. He loves us. What good news it is to be able to receive the joy of our salvation. And this reference to Savior and Christ and Lord, all three of those used in one, displays the saving work of Jesus and also his sovereign position, his position as God, as the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. There it is. The word spoken to them, it is fulfilled. It already has been fulfilled and they will know. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts. So he's got an entourage with him praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Some translations say goodwill among men. We have sung these words in many Christmas songs. So while it may have only sounded like lyrics in a Christmas song. This is spoken by the angel of God and by the heavenly hosts. So praise God in the highest, glory to God. And on earth here, peace among all of those who God is pleased with or who are in the will of God. And we will experience peace because of what Jesus did. It's never about what we do. It's only about what he has done. And therefore, that joy cannot be taken from us. It cannot be stolen from us by any person. It is with us because of who Jesus is and because of what he did. So we don't ever have to prove anything to anybody. You know, this is the beautiful thing is that that joy is always there. It's unspeakable. It's inexhaustible. Now, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened with the Lord as made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. So notice how they had such an urgency after hearing that word from the angel. And they were like, we got to go. Let's go see it. And, and when they saw it, it, this strange sight, the fact that you've got a baby lying in a feeding trough. Imagine if the angel hadn't told them that this is how you're going to know that this is the Christ. They would have been like, I don't think that's the Christ. He is lying in the barrel where all of the animals feed out of. I don't think that's him. He would not be placed there. But yet they told him and they know that it is indeed him. So when they saw that, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. So they spread the word and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. So Mary didn't go out, you know, proclaiming all of this to the world. She kept it to herself and very wisely. I mean, she was calm. She was peaceful. She was quiet. And she simply was seeking to understand everything was happening. I mean, imagine being Mary at this moment, already filled with so many hormones and emotions, having given birth, knowing that you've given birth to the savior of the world, the Messiah. I would imagine that she would have to be in this place of pondering, she probably doesn't have even the energy to be able to get up and start, you know, declaring that here is the savior of the world. So God will use certain people to do certain things. She has a very important role, one of the most important roles at this time. And so God does not require her to do all the things. And sometimes we can do that. We can put ourselves in a place of feeling like we need to do all the things. I am guilty as charged for that. I wanna do it all. I'm a visionary. I get a million visions a day of what I wanna complete and then I get my overwhelmed and sidetracked and then I don't get anything done. So this is something that the Lord is always working with me on, to have that Mary-like spirit, that quiet, calm, and understanding spirit. 
And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. So they were glorifying and praising God for the word that was fulfilled as it was told to them. Amazing. And we see this happening all the time in our own lives, where God fulfills promises, where he answers prayers. So are you claiming and proclaiming and declaring the goodness of God when that happens? Are you praising him? Are you telling people about it? You know, that is our testimony. When God fulfills, when God shows up, when God meets our needs, that is a powerful testimony that will be so impactful to people around you. And at the time of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So this was according to the law that on the eighth day, the babies would be circumcised. And now Jesus is presented at the temple. Verse 22, and when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So notice that Jesus is being included in this purification. He didn't need to be purified, yet he is so that he can identify with the sinner so that he can identify with mankind. Now in Leviticus chapter 12, this is spoken that it would happen 40 days after birth where the firstborn male would be dedicated to the service of the Lord completely and fully. So this purification process, well, definitely Mary as a new mom is going to have to be purified and cleansed after giving birth. And they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. And so this was five miles they would have to travel from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. And every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. So holy and set apart. They are dedicated to the service of God. So this goes to show that Mary and Joseph were faithful Jews. They were devout. They were obedient to the law. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, if you remember the law, it was actually supposed to be a lamb that was sacrificed unless you were poor and couldn't afford it, which goes to show that Jesus comes from a poor heritage. He comes from a poor background. Joseph and Mary could not afford the spotless lamb. And so they do offer the pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel or the comforter of Israel or the Messiah, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So this is a man who is dependable. He is devoted. He is sensitive to the Spirit. He is driven by the Spirit, and he's also very truthful, which we will see in just a little bit. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he was waiting for the Christ to show up and he came in the spirit into the temple. So the spirit led him there. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. He's like, now I can die in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation or your light through Jesus, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. So this revelation available to all. And this is the first time that we are seeing both Jews and Gentiles being stated together in the book of Luke. And for the glory to your people, Israel. So there it is, the Jewish people and the Gentiles. So this glory here is being shown through Jesus to the world who would then be able to see the fulfillment of God's promises. Verse 33, and his father and his mother marveled at what they said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. This is a really incredible statement here and I can't imagine being on the receiving end of that as Mary he is saying basically to her listen I'm going to bless you right now this child is going to be appointed for the fall and rising of many meaning he's going to be like a magnet he is going to both attract 
lots of people, which he does, but he's also going to repel a lot of people the way that a magnet does for those who choose not to believe him. And the fact that he is going to be a sign that is opposed, he's going to have a target on his back. That is the, the same word that translates to target in Hebrew of great evil. The evil will oppose him. So after all of the relatively good news that Mary is hearing, now she is hearing that a sword is going to not only pierce her son, but her as well. And what did this mean for her? Well, if you think about it, if you were a mother, you know that when you see your child rejected, bullied, harassed, knocked around, it hurts you just as much. You carry that rejection and that burden, if not more than your child does. You know, for myself this year, on the first day of school, my son decided last year that he was not going to play football this year. And so when he went to school on the first day and came home, I asked him, how was your day today? And the very first thing he told me was, there was no room for me at the lunch table and it hurt my heart so bad. And I said, well, who were you trying to sit with? And he said, all my friends. And I immediately thought, okay, well, all of his friends are football players. And so we talked about it a little bit and that night he came to me and he said, mommy, can I play football this year? Do you think it's too late for me to try out for the football team? Because they had been practicing all summer long. And thank God he was able to get back on the football team and he immediately felt accepted and received once again. There was room for him the next day on the lunch table, but it just hurts so bad as a mother to see that rejection and to feel that rejection. And that is what Mary is going to experience, not only through his rejection, but also having to watch his death come to pass. So she carries with her such a great privilege as the mother of the Messiah, but such a huge burden as well, knowing that all of this is going to take place. So this is going to happen to Mary so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So Jesus is going to come to expose the things that are hidden. Verse 36, and there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. We don't know a whole lot about Anna, but she's a prophetess, so she's speaking the words of God. She was advanced in years, so a little bit older, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. Whoa. Now remember, being a widow during this time was one of the most disgraceful positions to be in. So she could have very well been a bitter woman at this point, but she wasn't. It drew her closer to the Lord and take a look at how she is. She did not depart from the temple, but instead worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at the very hour, she began to give thanks to God and speak to him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So here's this woman who had every reason to be down in the dumps, yet we find her worshiping, fasting, praying, praising, thanking, witnessing, prophesying. And I think, man, when we get into those crappy situations of life, how do we react? Where do we end up? What do we end up doing? Are we like Anna the prophetess, where we go to the Lord and worship and praise and with gratitude and fasting? I think most of us probably don't, but what an example that Anna the prophetess set for us here today. This was one of the more powerful things that I read in this chapter because I glanced over this, I think, in the past, and now having read it today with new eyes, I was like, wow, what an amazing woman. What a woman for me to study more in depth. So I love that. I love this woman and how she comes forth boldly speaking to all of the people, prophesying to them, to those who are waiting to be saved. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. So here we see the end of baby Jesus and his spirituality is increasing. He is filled with wisdom. He's also growing strong physically as well. And this is a beautiful prayer for us to model after just in this one verse. Lord, will you please allow my child to be strong? Give him wisdom, Lord. Fill him up and may the favor of God be upon him. A short and sweet and simple prayer that you could easily pray every single day when your child exits the car. That's one of the things that I love to do when my kids leave the car is to bless them on their way out. Even if they don't hear me, I am bestowing a blessing upon them as they exit in their coming and in their going. Verse 41. 
Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Because remember, they are devout people. They follow the law. They do the things. So this is customary for the people who are outside of Jerusalem to make that trek three times a year to celebrate the Passover, the Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So this is one of three feasts that they are celebrating here. And when he was 12 years old, and by the way, 12 years old is significant here because this was the age where children would typically start to take on the trade of their fathers. Well, check out what Jesus is doing. He is not necessarily taking on the trade of carpentry of Joseph. He is taking on the father's business, his father in heaven. They went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it. And I thought, how did they not know that their son was not with them? Well, we all, I shouldn't say we all, most of us have had that moment where we have lost our child at one point. I remember losing my daughter when she was three in the airport, when we were all running to one gate to the next as a big family. We had like 14 people with us. And I thought someone was watching her. I thought my husband had her or my, or my mom as I was rushing ahead to get to the next gate to get them to hold the plane for us. And when I, we all got to the gate, everyone looked around and said, where's Rel? And I just remember that slow motion feeling of looking back and seeing her in the sea of people. She was probably a good, I don't know, 100, at least 100 yards from me. And I ran as fast as I could. And I feel like I couldn't run fast enough to get to her because she was just standing with her little blankie in the middle of the crowd looking around for anybody who looked familiar. So they didn't even know that he wasn't with them. And this can happen to us spiritually. You know, we can go to church and be filled up and then leave church and leave Jesus behind. You know, we cannot leave church and just assume that just because we went there, it means Jesus is with us and anointing us. That anointing may not be upon us because we end up leaving church and leaving him behind. We don't bring him with us. We take our Jesus off at the door, you know, so this does happen. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. This is key here, is that they went back to the place where they were with him last. And so for us, whenever we are lost, whenever we feel like God is far from us or that Jesus is not with us or near us, go back to the place where you were with him last. What were you doing? Were you in your devotions every day? Were you going to church faithfully? Were you tithing? Were you worshiping him in your car? Were you doing the things that were bringing you into greater fellowship with him? Were you surrounding yourself with people who were like-minded? Where was it that you were last that you had that sweet spot with Jesus? So that's what they did. And after three days, they found him dun, 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 in the temple. <laughs> sitting among the teachers, meaning the Jewish rabbis and scholars. Sometimes uh, your, your translation might say doctors. Listening to them and asking them questions. So at 12 years old, this is amazing that he is sitting at the feet of the rabbis, listening to what they are teaching and questioning them. He isn't debating them, but he's definitely raising some pretty important questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were also astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching all over for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? So when I read this before, I was like, whoa, Jesus, like ease up on the disrespect with your parents there. But I don't hear it that way anymore. I really, truly believe he was honoring them and say, why, mom and dad, were you looking for me? You knew I would be here. You knew I wanted to be learning and to be hearing from these teachers because I have to. This is what I've been sent here to do. I mean, what an incredible spirit that he already is displaying to his parents. And there were three I must in the book of Luke where he says here, I must be about my father's business. And then he says in chapter four, I must preach. And then in chapter nine, I must suffer. These are three things that he declares that he has to do before he leaves this earth. 
Now, they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them, so he did honor them. You know, he left and came to Nazareth, and he was submissive to them. So he honored his mother and his father because of the fact that he was so secure in his in who he was and what he was supposed to do. He was able to just simply be submissive. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. So Jesus was very aware of his unique mission and his unique relationship with the Father. And therefore, he is not only obedient to his Father in heaven, but he is also obedient and submissive to his earthly father and mother. And because so, he therefore increased in stature. He was being developed for what he was going to be doing whenever he was empowered by the Spirit to go into ministry at the age of 30. So even though he is technically God, he is still fully man and he wasn't Superman overnight. He had to be developed just the same way that we do. Don't get discouraged or down on yourself if you don't feel like you are walking like Jesus or walking like that person or you don't have that kind of knowledge quite yet. Don't worry about it. We're all on our own journey and it is so unique just the way that Jesus' mission was. We've got our own calling, we've got our own mission, we've got our own assignments. God knew exactly when we would show up. He knew exactly the day and the time when we would receive Him and when we would start to be developed ourselves. But the beautiful promise here is that if we too are submissive to that and we place ourselves at the feet of Jesus and we learn His Word and we take on that heart of desiring that knowledge and that wisdom, we too will increase favor with God and with man. We will start to have better relationships. We will start to have better friendships. This is just part of the fruit of submission that you will increase, that you will be developed. So we thank you so much, Lord, for what you were doing within each and every one of us. Thank you for our path, our purpose, our life, our assignment, our mission. I pray that you will reveal it to us if we do not yet know what we are supposed to be doing here on this earth, God. But it is something powerful and it has been purposed by you. It is already written down. It already was before we were ever even formed in our mother's womb. So I just pray that we will be able to see that, to hold on to it, to start to develop it, to grow in it, Lord. May we not be hasty about it, but be patient, God, knowing that these things don't happen overnight and that we do need to come day in and day out just the same way, Jesus, that you did, that you were at the temple, that you were at their feet. But more than anything, thank you for what you have done, Jesus. We could not be saved by the law, and therefore you came to fulfill it. We still can't be saved by the law. The government can't save us. The government's not going to protect us. It's you, Lord. And so we just ask for your anointing, for your protection. We ask for your power to be restored within our nations, oh God. I just pray that there will be repentance, that there will be a revival, that people will come to know you, to be submitted before you, to tell the world how they are still in need of a Savior, just the same way that people were back then. I thank you for the mention of the women, Lord, and the genealogy, Jesus, and for giving us some hope that no matter what we have done, God, you still have such a beautiful plan for our lives and that we are a part of that royal heritage and that you can take even the deepest darkest things expose them clean them purify them Lord but and be able to take our lives and exalt it into a place of honor not for ourselves God but for your glory alone So I pray that we will be receptive to that. I pray, Lord, that we will receive that gift of grace and mercy that you have given to all people. It is every single person, Lord, that you want to be able to see saved, but also used for your glory. So help us to do that, Lord. We love you so much. We thank you for this time and for this gospel today. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I wanna give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe 
So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer. I'm gonna put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.